What a marvelous, marvelous thing. Oh, yes. God is doing right now and what he has done. I tell you, it's just, there's a sweet spirit flowing here this morning as, as we think about, you know, and I, I know we, we all have stuff. We, we talked about the different things that are going on in all of our lives and you know, folks that have had accidents, folks that have had surgery, folks that are waiting on results from surgery, um, and folks that are having back issues and knee issues. I heard that yesterday with Reverend David Jones and um, all sorts of things that we're all going through. However, Does anybody know who is still sitting on the throne and who is in control? Uh, my message this morning is three growth areas. We heard the passage of scripture coming from Luke chapter 2, verses 50 through 52, with the emphasis on verse 52. And if I can just read that again. Now, it's going to read a little different than what we read in the NIV version. Uh, in my Bible that's on my iPad, it says it in the King James Version. I haven't downloaded the NIV yet. It says, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So we're going to look at the three growth areas today. And I'm just going to focus on three areas. Uh, one of the things I learned when I started in the school system is you give three points because if you give more than three points, they might lose a little something along the way because you give too much and they get overwhelmed. Amen. And then when I started preaching, I found out it's the very same stuff. Three points and be done. So I'm going to give my three points today, and I'm going to be done. We're going to talk about the three areas, spiritual growth in through is as in wisdom, statue, stature, meaning your influence, and we're going to talk about favor which means being preferred. Those three areas. That's what I want to talk about this morning. So, we're going to look at this passage in light of what it says to us today. You know, and I know we've been marveled at the story of Jesus talking with the elders. And I remember growing up hearing that, and then there's the song that we sometimes sing, you know, amen, 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 amen. And then there's a verse in there that says, see him in the temple talking with the elders. All right, so I've heard that all my life, as probably you have. But as I thought about that this week, I thought about it in a different light because there is so much in that one little verse. And if we think about it, we have no other scriptural account. Notice I said scriptural account of Jesus' childhood other than the birth experience. And this experience when he was about 12 years old. Then it skips forward to the starting of his great Galilean ministry when he's in his 30s. All the rest of that 
is missing except for three, these three words. He grew in wisdom, stature, and favor. Favor with God and favor with man. Now, having said all that, let's, let's start off with something that we know, okay? Growth takes place throughout our life. Now, one of the things that I used to hear when I was a little child, sometimes when you'd step across the line, you know, get out of your lane, in other words, who you think you are? Don't you talk to me like that. I'm grown. Mm -hmm. And you respect grown folks. Don't get in grown folks' conversation. And I'd go off somewhere because I knew better than say it in the presence of <laughs> grown folks. <laughs> I can't wait till I'm grown. Then I can tell them a thing or two. See, things like that you know not to say in the presence Amen. of grown folk. Amen. All right? Because my grandmother had a saying said, because I'll make you laugh out the wrong side of your mouth. <laughs> And another grandmother said, I'll knock you for a row of ash cans. And I, I had visions of being, being whacked one time and twirling down the alley. Yeah. And everybody's ash cans where they dumped from their coal furnace tumbling over. And me looking like an ashy mess at the end of the alley laid out in the street. Because grandma had given me one great big whack and sent me spinning. So there's certain things you knew not to do. Amen. All right? So that's all part of growing up. There's certain things you know and you don't do. But growing doesn't stop once you are physically at a certain height. All of us in here, I don't care how old we are, from the little baby right there to, oh, I ain't gonna point nobody out. I'm just, <laughs> the oldest of us in the room. Now, I know some of y'all looking around now, who, who is that today, all right? All right, and we're not gonna put nobody on the spot. But to the oldest of us in the room, we are still growing. All right? We may not be growing this way, all right? But as we grew, our hair has changed wow. from what it was when we were in those of us that are over the age of <clears throat> 20. <laughs> my hair has changed from my 20s. I had a fro, all right? I had a... <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, dear. And when I wasn't wearing the fro, I was wearing cornrows. Now, the fro is no longer black. The hair is no longer black. black. There's some frost. Yeah, I, could, I got tongue tied even saying it. The hair is frosty now. What's left of it? There ain't enough to cornrow no more. All right? And don't even think, I ain't going no weave, uh-uh. That's just not happening. So we're growing. You said we're growing. We're growing because things change. Skin that used to be tight has now started to sag a little bit with what we call age. But I, I remember him one time and said, oh, when I first got my first gray hair and I was standing there going, no, no, no. And I remember my grandmother saying, oh, shucks, child, that's just a sign of wisdom coming on. Well, I didn't know whether I liked wisdom. But as I grow, I understand what you're saying. So growth, physical growth continues all our lives. We grow because we don't walk as fast as we used to. We don't skip steps like we used to. We don't heal as fast as we used to. All right? 
I ain't gonna try to run track no more because I might not make it from here to the first pew without having to stop to take a breath. So, so growth is something that happens. It just, it just grows differently. We grow in physical size. We grow in knowledge. All of us in here know more than we did when we were that little child's age. We grow in knowledge. And I dare say every one of us in here, and this is another area of growth, we grow in influence. I don't care who you are or what your station in life is or, or you know, what kind of education you have. You have influence over somebody. There's somebody who listens to what you have to say. There is somebody who hangs their hat on the things that come out of your mouth because of what you have experienced and what you now know and how you have channeled what you know. The text models for us a form of how Jesus grew and how we should grow. The first area of growth is wisdom. And Jesus grew in wisdom. Okay, now, in order to grow in wisdom, you first have to gain some knowledge. knowledge. You first have to know something. Okay? You got to start off learning. So some knowledge has got to be poured into you. Every little bitty thing we know or we learn, once we internalize it, it becomes something that we know. Now, we can learn how to recite facts, all right, to put on a test. But until you internalize the information that you're given and it becomes a part of you, you don't know it. That's right. Now, let me give you an example. And some of you all, if I mention this man's name, you'll know it's not a person I'm talking about. Roy G. Biv. Anybody know who that is? I know Mr. Hartwine knows. All right. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. The colors of the rainbow. That's how I learned them. Because to memorize them in the right order, that was how I learned it. I had to internalize it by coming up with a system that made it something that I could then hang a hook, hang a hook in it and say, I now master this. I now know this. And so even now, I know it. I bet you if I said, give me the vowel sounds, everybody in here can say A-E-I-O-U and sometimes Y. Because it was drilled into you and drilled into you and drilled into you. I bet you if I said Psalm 23, somebody's going to say the Lord. There you go. See, why? It's because somebody made sure you learned it. You, some kind of way you found a hang, a place to hang that knowledge. Or if I threw out the word, the scripture, John 3.16. For God so loved the world. All right? You didn't have to pick up the Bible and say, all right. You didn't have to go to a concordance and say, all right. All right. It's something that has been internalized into your being. It's something that has become a part of your being. All right, so that's knowledge. But then wisdom comes when you know how to take the things that you know and apply them in the right place. Now, if I had just stood up here this morning and come up to the pulpit 
and just said, good morning, Roy G. Biv. That's the expression I get. What? What's Reverend talking about? Has he lost his mind? I would have had to have some kind of way to preface that. I would have had to have some kind of way to make it something that you could relate it to. So I could show you what we are, where we were going with this. Let me give you another point. You can know how to move a car and not know how to drive. Awful quiet this morning. You can know how to take a key and put it in the ignition. Babies watch folk. Some little children go out, and if you that's why they tell you don't leave children alone in the car, because they've watched and they've watched and they've watched and they've watched. They know how to turn an, a key yes, sir. and start a car. Yes, sir. That's why they have all sorts of things now where you have to have your foot on the brake in order to start the car. It has to be in park in order to start the car, or if it's a standard shift, which some of us know how to drive. All right, it has to be in a certain place and your foot has to be on the brake and the clutch in order for it to start so that there are safety precautions. But you can know how to move a car and yet know how, not know how to drive. You know it, but the wisdom comes when you know the rules of the road and how to apply the rules of the road to the changing situations of the road and how to watch for the various things using all the different mirrors and what it takes to back up and what you have to watch when you back up. It's more to, 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 to driving than just knowing how to hold the steering wheel and guide it down the road. Amen. Am I right? All right, so the wisdom comes in knowing how to apply the knowledge that you have. Now, let me just put that in a spiritual perspective to show you why Jesus grew in wisdom. Because he just did not know scripture that he could spit out and quote. There's a lot of people that can quote Bible verses, but they don't know the substance of what it means and how to apply it to their lives. Some people are walking concordances. You can say, well, you know, there's this verse that starts this, that, or the other. Oh, you're talking about scripture such and such and so and so, chapter this cha and verse that. They can tell you that. Well, what does it mean? Well, they don't know how to apply it to any situation, and every scripture does not apply to every situation. Amen. And every situation that you go through as you read the scripture and as the spirit speaks to you, it's going to give you a different meaning based on the situation that you go through. That's what the spirit does. That's where the wisdom comes. It tapers what you know with what you're going through and the wisdom comes in how to apply it. So Jesus confounded the elders because he just didn't know how to read the Torah or the Old Testament. He knew how to understand it, how to interpret it, and to apply it and that's what amazed the elders in the temple. And when they asked him questions, he knew how to answer their questions with wisdom and then say, okay, now let me ask you a question. So, first comes the impartation of the knowledge. And then as you learn to apply the knowledge, that's where wisdom comes. And the more you apply the knowledge, the more you learn from that knowledge. And sometimes going back over stuff that you already know, you get more wisdom out of it. You heard me state, make the statement, every time you go to the well, you're coming up with a different bucket of water. 
Well, you see, every time you go to the word of God, you're going to come up with something different. Even if you've read that verse before, even if you think you know that ver verse backwards, forwards and upside down, when you go there, you're going to get something different. God's going to show you something that you didn't get before. You're going to be able to pull something else out of it that you didn't get before because now you have more experiences. You've gone through something that you hadn't gone through before. You didn't need to have some more wisdom because you hadn't gone through what you're going through right now. Now you have a need, so now you have to find out a new application for what you're going through right now so that you go back to something you go through. I never saw this before. You didn't see it before because you weren't going through where you are now. You have not grown to that place where you're going through something. Now I understand some stuff that I heard when I was a child. When they said, I said, I don't get it. Well, honey, keep on living. You get it. So, Jesus grew in wisdom. And he grew in stature. In other words, he grew in the um, size of of what he now knows. The size of what's been poured into him. And the, and the more you know, the more wisdom you're going to get. Because now you're going to be able to take the more knowledge as you grow in size of what you know. You're going to have more ways to turn that into wisdom as to how to apply it. Because the more you know, the more now you become responsible for. And see, that's where the problem comes. Some people don't want to grow too far because then they're going to be responsible and they have to be accountable for what they now know. You see, Let's go back to our car for a minute. You see, those of us that have a driver's license, and I remember, how many of you remember the first day you got your first driver's license? Everybody in here remember that? Oh, I can now drive. Huh? Give me the keys, let me go. But with that comes responsibility. Because that car can carry you to point, from point A to point B, but that car is also a weapon. That's true. It can take somebody's life. Yes. It can take your life. Yes, it can cause you to be maimed. It can also cause somebody else to be maimed. So it can be a blessing and it can also be a curse. So, what happens is, you are now accountable for what you now know. And there are people out there that hold you accountable for what you now know. And you see, that's what the Holy Spirit does. That's what the church does. That's what we as believers are supposed to do as we grow in grace. We now are supposed to be able to hold each other accountable. And let me qualify that in love. So that we build each other up, not tear each other down. All right. Because when you are learning, when you are learning, you will make mistakes. But you know, most pencils I see have erasers on them. And then I remember when I was in sixth grade, a teacher saying to a class one time after she had put the grades on the report card in ink, she says, let me tell you what an ink eradicator can do. In other words, I can erase what's down in ink too. We have something now called whiteout, or they got this little thing now, you can run it over something, cover up what you wrote, and then you can write over it again. Typewriters, they came out with corrector type. Now we got something called a backspace. I got a little button on this keyboard right here. I can delete 
and it doesn't show up and I can write something else over it. And once I hit the delete button, it's gone. So you see, so if you make a mistake, mistakes can be fixed. Yeah, that's right. The problem is if you leave the mistake and don't try to fix it. Wisdom comes is when you see the mistake and you say, okay, I've made a mistake. It's not the end of the world. So what am I going to do about it? I'm going to fix it. And where the church comes in is when we hold each other accountable, we don't look down on us, mm, you messed up, didn't you? Uh -huh, I knew that was coming. No. What we need to say, you know what, there before the grace of God go out. So what we should be doing is, all right, you can fix this. It's going to take some time. There's a consequence, but it can be fixed. And God still can take that experience and turn it around for your good. Look at Joseph. Look at all that Joseph went through. Yes. Now granted, some of that was not Joseph's mistake. That's right. He ended up in the wrong place at the wrong time and some of that wasn't his doing. That's right. But God still turned that horrible situation around into something that God used for his good. I believe that's why the scripture tells us all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So even our mistakes work for our good if we know how to apply the wisdom of what we know, fix the mistake, accept the consequences, be accountable to one another, be accountable to God, pick up the pieces, hold up your head, and walk on each day by faith. That's where the stature comes in of growing tall. I got one more point, and then I'm done. I touch you three points. The wisdom, the stature, now the favor. Now, yeah, it, it says the favor with God and with man. Okay, now, I looked at it this way. When somebody, when you have favor with someone, there's a couple of things. Number one, they take notice. You're on their radar. They notice. All right? Favor also means you have preference. Yes. Yes. They prefer you. All of us in here have people that favor each and every one of you from the back to the front. Come on now. Come on. And y'all know I'm right. There are people that you know that would jump over two government mules and a spotted dog just to have you in their company. Somebody laughing, ain't they? I can't see. Yeah, y'all laughing. I'm serious as a heart attack. Now you think about it. Who calls you? Who talks to you? Who comes by to see who you? Uh, who, go, who do you go by and see? Now I'm going to take it to another level. Who's in love with you? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. I, 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 I can see that from up here. Ray Charles can see that. Uh-huh. And she looked right at you, too. You know, I might be halfway blind, but I can see that. You pointed over her head, she turned her head and looked at you. Because mm -hmm. you know you're right and she know you're right. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Everybody else around here know it too. And I'm not saying that to single you I just happened to see what happened. But I know some of y'all were thinking, you know, what, you know, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, what about that? That's favor. That is favor. And it says here that Jesus grew in wisdom, statue, and favor. He was preferred, but who was he preferred by? He was preferred, number one, by God. That's what it says. He was preferred by God. God sought him out. That was his only begotten son, number one. He had that kind of relationship with God, and God had that kind of relationship with him. How do we know this? We can look at the conversations they had. 
The biggest one that comes to mind is when he prayed for Lazarus to be raised from the dead. He said, Father, I'm not doing this for my sake because you and I know I don't have to go through this long prayer because all I have to do is say it and you'll do it. Basically, that's what he was saying because they had spent time together. They had been in ongoing communications from day one. And some of y'all have friends. That's the man part. In favor with God and you got favor with men. There's some of y'all that talk to certain people every day and I dare say several times Amen. a day. Amen. Uh-huh, I got some nods. I could see that. Amen. You know I'm right? Sure do. Because I get folks I talk to several times a day. Why? Because they have favor in my life. I prefer to talk to them. I prefer to hear from them. I prefer for them having some influence in my life and they prefer me having some influence in their life. And the people that you don't favor and the people that don't favor you, you don't care whether they like you or not. You don't care whether they love you or not. When you hear somebody say, mm, I don't like her, I don't like it. Oh well. And you tell them talk to the hand. Because you have folks that do prefer you. There are folks that you do have favor with. Folks that you favor. And most of all, if you know that God favors you. And you favor God. I prefer to spend time talking to God every day. Why? Because God prefers to call me out every now and then. Hey, what you doing? That's the way God and I talk. Uh, I, I know what you're going through. Don't think I don't know. Just because I didn't say nothing, I'm watching. Well, God, you ain't doing nothing yet. That's what you think. You should know me by now. God, I'm hurting. Don't you think I know you hurting? Don't, who, who do you think gave the blueprint on you? I knew you before you were. I know everything you're going through. So when you tell me, I already know. But I just want to hear your voice. Okay, God, I got this. So now, where are we going from here, God? Okay, God, wherever you say, that's what I want to hear. That's the favor part. When God prefers you, and you prefer God, and in the same token, there are people that favor you, and you favor them. So what does that mean? Where's the challenge come? Because there are people you have can yet reach that maybe you're not reaching right now. Oh yeah, there, 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 there had to be a challenge. Yes, sir. There are people that would like to get to know and fellowship with you. But you like this. Mm -hmm. And most of us have this little bubble that we keep like this because we guard certain areas. And I'm saying, yeah, God, the wisdom comes in knowing where and who you can let into Amen. that bubble. Amen. Amen. Because the scripture tells us not to cast our pearls before swine. Amen. Now, I'm not calling nobody no pig. Right. But what it's saying is don't give spiritual things to people who cannot handle them. So people who are not there, you don't share those things with. Yeah, you're right then to keep that guard up. There are people who can't handle your testimony, number one, because it will threaten them because they're not ready to deal with where they are. Yeah, I said it and I didn't stir, stir, stutter. There are people 
that need your testimony and they will do what the covenant says they will not needlessly expose the infirmity of the weak but will with tender sympathy bear one another's burdens and sorrows. There are people you can include in your prayer life and it will stay right there between the two of you and what will happen, you will continue to grow in stature. You will continue to grow tall in the Lord. You will continue to get more wisdom in the Lord and God will continue to show you more favor and God will, in other words, continue to prefer to to be in fellowship with you, he'll look down and say, what's going on right there? Yes. I need to be more involved in yes. them. Yes, sir. Because they're so involved in the things of me. Yes. Those, those are the three areas that are in that one little verse in verse 52. Just in that one little verse. I got all that meat this week. And I gave you the other verses because I felt like I needed to give you some preface for it. Because I know some folks don't think we've, we've had a responsive reading unless we have at least three or four verses. Well, we could have had that one verse. That one verse. And I don't know whether it's the older I get, the crazier I get or the more understanding I get that God wants us to get out of the box. Because he's preferring us. Why is he preferring us? Let me give you another verse. For it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Or in other words, however, when he shall appear, we shall be like him. And I'm going to add something else to tie verse 52 into it. How are we going to be like him? In wisdom and in stature and in favor. Is there one this morning? Is there one? Time to raise the bar. It's time to stretch out and see ourselves and the potential that God sees in each of us. It's that time. Just that plain and simple. And with all the crazy mess that's going on in the world. And I'm not trying to say when I think God is going to send the angel down to blow the trumpet so Jesus can return. But I'm saying well, all the crazy mess that's going on right now, I think we're getting closer and closer and closer and closer. And what worries me is some of the churches that call themselves evangelicals are embracing stuff that's going farther and farther and farther away from what God wants. How do I know this? I'm seeing more hate and more hate and more hate and more hate and more hate. Of God. Somebody has got to do like the prophets of old and say, if I'm the only one, I'm going to stand up and say, it's wrong. And no, I'm not going to call out no names, nothing like that. But I do say there's a saying, if the shoe fits, now I'm talking globally now, if the shoe fits, somebody ought to put the shoe on and say, I need to fix this. 